Thank you for coming. Um, it is my pleasure and joy to introduce, introduce Eva Frank in Gilbert, um, a friend from many years of SIAC and a personal friend. Um, I, I, was, I was thinking what was the best way to try to give a context of Eva's work and Eva's uh, curiosity. And the best, thing I, uh, the, the, the best thing I came up with is Eva is what, the equivalent of a music producer, the equivalent of a Brian Eno or people like that. There are people who work in collaboration with others. They have the appetite and the curiosity to navigate multiple interests, uh, multiple ways to see the world and the world of architecture. And her career is a peculiar one and a unique one um, from, from her, her days at the storefront in New York. And she put a, a, an extraordinary sequence of shows. And now, as the director of the Architectural, Architectural Association, one of those extraordinary places that we consider um, an old sister. I mean, it has way many, many more years than Saya, but the AA and Saya and other, another few places in the world, I think they generate a sisterhood um, of unique kind of independent institution. And I think Eva is the right person for the right time to be conducting the AA. Uh, I think the AA suits her and she suits the AA because this reason I was talking about this capacity to operate like a music producer and to don't be um, bound by, let's say, constraint or more traditional ways to understand architecture and the discipline of design. Uh, she has a way to navigate this in a very contemporary way that there are not that many figures in our field that have that. Certainly, I'm not one of them. Uh, I'm, I'm, much more, I, I'm much more an ideologue than uh, an old school in many ways. And I think Eva represents a, a, a different kind of breathe about what we understand architecture as a cultural practice in the natural sense of the world. So it's always, it's always a lot of fun to see her lecture. Um, you, you'll, you'll see why. Um, so it, it's, a kind of a, it's a kind of a way to operate um, almost in the way that uh, I will say technology operates these days. You have this enormous capacity to keep assimilating possibilities and put it out there and frame it in a way that somehow it makes sense. So it is with a lot of pleasure and I'm very curious to see what she has to share with us tonight. Please join me to welcome Eva Frank to Sayer once again. As a musical producer, producer today, I want to thank Hernan for inviting me again uh, to an institution that, as, as Hernan said, I've been here in many capacities and uh, several times because it is a really incredible place to be and, and I hope that I can honor uh, that fabulous introduction. Um, <clears throat> I always start my lectures with uh, kind of a bit of context. And yes, today I'm speaking as the director of the Architectural Association, but I might take you through a few um, reflections about where do I think architecture stands today and how each one of us, we might want to relate uh, to this, if you want, existing context or changing condition that is a planet that is, that is turning to in speeds that actually might be a bit more um, difficult to follow than the ones that we were used to. Just to put an example, um, this was the first time in my life I met a mem um, to try to really understand what is that that is happening around us today. We have been just uh, uh, touching ourselves with elbows and yet we don't know the scale nor the magnitude of what is that that is around us right now and how that is going to change the way in which we run an architecture school, the way in which we relate with each other, the way in which we are going to be living together, as this uh, year's Venice Biennale is asking us. And so for me, what is interesting about the current condition is that we are in front not only of uh, biological uh, questions, but also technological ones, ones that are allowing, are allowing us to somehow wonder and, and put a question mark in the role of architecture, and what is the role of the architect today. When we do have algorithms that are able to somehow measure, quantify, analyze, 
and to give us ways of understanding uh, very complex issues about who we are and how we want to live together, then the question is, how do we, as architects, uh, respond to it? And so, for me, what is interesting about uh, the society in which we find ourselves today is to really identify what are some of the important questions. And, and in a certain way, very similar to what a uh, few architects have said before me, is that our role as architects is always to think ahead of our own time. And, and for a few years now, I've been talking about something that I call the theory of earliness. And, and how do we actually get there before society gets there? And this theory of earliness is not something that I am trying to write, but actually something that I'm trying to collectively write. How do we all, as architects, uh, try to really understand what is that that is going to be driving uh, the future? And not that we actually just uh, uh, operate in a kind of responsive way, but we operate in a projective way. It was back in 2013 when uh, uh, I came here to Sayar to give the commencement speech. And for the ones that were there uh, then and are still here, I hope that you were teachers, because if you are students, that's some time ago. Um, and I actually presented um, a taxonomy that has helped me over the years to uh, make every one of my friends, colleagues, and the students reflect about who we are and how each one of you positions yourself. I always say that there are three types of architects, three types. Um, the first one is the enabler is the one that tries to facilitate uh, existing structures, that tries to bring people together, is somehow the post-it architect, is the one that tries to find a spaces of consensus. Some ways the enabler is not that different, if you want, from the dictator. It just simply tries to solidify and to bring into place existing forms of thinking. The second type is the iconographer. Is the one that tries to produce iconic forms, forms of reference, semiotic elements that allows us to identify uh, uh, objects or ideas that resonate with things that we already know. We, they end up, if you want the iconographers, making buildings that look like uh, butterflies or look like sails or look like tulips. And interestingly enough, the iconographers, even if they are attempting to do something sublime, most of the times they always end up doing something pretty banal and definitely far away from the revolutionary. And then you have the third type that is the agitator, that is that architect that is against everything and all that actually is trying to denounce the problematic structures of power that are surrounding us and, and somehow to produce an alternative form of, of action but yet doesn't really have a, an iconographic project or an enabling project, doesn't know how to bring people together around it or doesn't know how to actually produce a new aesthetic regime about it. And of course, what I'm interested in is how those agitators are able to ask the right questions, how those iconographers are able to produce new aesthetics, and how those enablers are able to bring new collectivities. So if you, each one of you reflects what kind of architect are you, if you're an enabler, or an enabler and an iconographer, an enabler and an agitator, and the idea is that how those three legs, in fact, stand, are, are the three supports that I believe every architect needs to have. We all need to agitate and question and problematize the structures of power that we have inherited. We do need to enable new collectivities, and we do need to produce a new aesthetic regime. And so, when I gave that commencement speech, I said that was for me the sci -arch architect. In fact, of course, I've always called it that that's a utopianizer, an architect that is able to actually look into our existing condition and actually produce something else. So I like to believe that I'm in a room full of utopianizers. And so it is in this, in this way of understanding the world, but specifically the world of architecture, that I wanted us to somehow go back to that very simple distinction about how do we position ourselves. I like to think with triads. I think uh, maybe it's a very simple way to get people to think about a, a not necessarily a kind of dialectical opposite engagement between two elements, uh, but in fact by understanding a relationship of three different elements. And a few years ago I started thinking about a series of philosophers uh, and thinkers that today are somehow trying to make us understand the way in which we are operating. Somehow, if you want, and these are very simplistic strokes, but one could say that the world today is, is articulated through ideas of anger. When Sloterdijk, if you want, talking about the spheres, is, it tries to somehow describe also Europe and its histories, has always been about the anger that is identified and embedded through ideological spheres in which one tries to position one against the other. And it is that anger of ones against the others that we are seeing a lot of different questions being played out around us. And I do think that, in fact, we do need to go beyond anger. 
And mostly because it is that ideological uh, uh, positioning that sometimes doesn't really allow us to see what is that that unites us instead of that what separates us. I always like to talk about um, a nice joke that is the one that uh, Slavuk Žižek uh, gave uh, when we were all part of Occupy Wall Street at some point, in which he was talking about the red ink and the blue ink, and if you don't know the joke, you should go uh, online and find it. I'm not going to repeat it here. But in fact, it would be summarized that we do not have the tools by which we can articulate our spaces of resistance, meaning we cannot, we cannot really truly imagine the end of capitalism. We cannot really truly imagine uh, forms of actually making the world more sustainable. We cannot imagine uh, uh, the solutions to the problems that we have in front of us. And so this situation in which we find ourselves surrounded by a certain sense of impossibilities, I think is throwing us into a, a third uh, space, if you want, from anger to impossibilities to objects, meaning the moment in which then we try to understand that the capacity of a particular object object, conceptual, physical, or otherwise, has the ability to somehow engender a particular set of uh, forces around itself and to start moving uh, uh, the conditions uh, that surround it. And so through this triad of angle impossibilities and objects, for me what is very interesting is that, well, um, sometimes as architects we simplify philosophies uh, uh, through very simple acts of abstraction. When I like to think that as architects, sometimes we are accused of just simply producing objects, much more interested in the kind of agency that goes around them. When I hear about anger, I'm much more interested in the idea of empathy that actually goes around it. And when I think about impossibilities, I'm much more interested in the idea of the new horizons that are able to somehow open up in front of us. And so, it is probably one of those that people have been hearing me talk about over the last year. And when I talk about empathy, it's not one uh, of those feelings that we necessarily have been practicing a lot. We practice generosity sometimes. Generosity is something that we know how to give. It's almost a form of narcissism, generosity. But empathy is a very different one. Empathy is about listening what is that that society or someone in front of us needs and try to understand how we can actually participate in that uh, uh, space of resolution. So what I've been asking everyone for the last year is to practice, practice something very simple, radical empathy. Because radical empathy is not just empathy, it's how can one be radical in that space of understanding who is this idea of the other, if there is such a thing as the other, and, and really try to actually push that so that ultimately when we look into this world, we really understand that, that this is us, that this actually this collective, that this is myself. No? And so when today I was um, trying to figure out what I was going to talk about tonight, I was uh, sitting in the Standard Hotel, who has become almost like my second home in the city, and I was looking outside of the window, and I was looking into this uh, fabulous plaza, and it reminded me that in 2013, I came here, and I, uh, and I went into this uh, space that you see in here, and I entered this building around 10 a.m. in the morning to visit one of the architectural offices in there. After that, I went into the 20th floor of this tower, and I visited another architectural office in there. And he would say, Eva, were you looking for a job? I wasn't. I was doing a research project that was a part of Office Us, the uh, US pavilion at the Venice Biennale at that time, but that was just the excuse by which I was trying to actually produce a new understanding of architectural practice, one of the things that I think is very important today. 2013, that morning, I woke up at 7, and I went at 8 a.m. I was at Tom Main's studio. At 9.30, I showed up at 10 at Gensler. Then I went to IACOM, 20th floor. I think they have moved now. After that, I went to Frank uh, uh, Gerris, and then I went to Eric Owen Moore's office, a fantastic journey that actually took me through very different, supposedly, architectural styles, ideologies of form and making. And yet, guess what? Some of the things still makes us all the same. So I'm going to tell you before I jump into telling you more about the EA, about something that I think is still important for all of us to think. That is when we start thinking about architecture as one firm or another firm or another firm, I like to think of all of us as one. And I like to think that everyone in this room is not just a single uh, sum of individuals, but in fact we are a collective. A collective that is not just in the idea of collective, but in fact a collective that politically is really much more radical than just a group of people saying we are a collective. 
I'd like us to take responsibility of all the architecture that is being built right now in the world. I want us to actually author the good, the bad, and the ugly. And to start making portfolios, not only of the things that we design, but those things that we allow to be designed on the name of contemporaneity. And what happens when one starts doing that? Well, I do think that we need to start a, a, a radical shift about how we think about architectural practice today. The legal, the financial, the labor structures that surround them. And how does one do that? Well, we started a research project. Anna Miliaki and Ashley Schaffer and myself, we started investigating the architecture that was produced over the last 100 years by American firms or North American firms around the world to try to understand the mechanisms of production and dissemination of ideas and to try to find ways in which these architectures produce the good the bad and the ugly, and to actually produce an archive that would allow us to somehow reflect and to see how each one of us was next to another building that one of our colleagues authored. To try to understand where ideas were coming from, the financial implications that related countries, politics, and architecture. I can tell you that there was no correlation, but we tried. Um, but what was very interesting about this process is that they started to unveil a lot of elements that um, as part of the sometimes beautiful fights that Anna and I would have, I always had what I call inductive research and she was doing deductive research. And I was always trying to produce cases that actually would reveal things that we didn't know yet that existed. And so trying to produce new methodologies of research, we started to look into issues like profit and how much money architects make over the years in relationship to different policies and, poli and, and policies and politics and laws that actually this country produce, or to understand the little effect of the Guggenheim Museum in a net sense of what kind of cultural capital, talking about $2 billion that were, uh, 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 $200 billion that were uh, 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 in construction back in 2014 uh, of museums without collections or without even a program. And to understand what is that architecture that is being produced. Any of us would do a museum today, right? The question is, what does, is that museum doing? Architecture is not just the form of that museum, it's the politics, it's the collection, it's the mission of that museum. And so, through each one of these projects, what we tried to do was to unveil and to find themes that would allow us to have conversations about how do we practice architecture today? What is that office space, the structures of labor, for negotiation, in which those glorious images of famous architects working with their disciples or with their friends would become something that actually is more radical, something that actually understands where we are today. As part of this project, we created an office of uh, six, if you want, uh, eight partners that were going to be leading this architecture office from the headquarters um, in the Venice Biennale. And while this was not the last supper, but the first breakfast, we believed of this, uh, of this pavilion, not a place of exhibition where people go for three minutes to consume an idea that they might like or not, we could care less about that, but to usually actually use those six months and all the architectural firms in the US that finally opened their doors because their work was going to be exhibited at the Venice Biennale, otherwise they would have never opened their doors, to really open up about what is that that actually we do, how we do it, and what motivates us. Office As was an office that actually you could hire, was an office that you actually could work with. And what was interesting about it is that over six months we take, took many of these projects and we tried to actually remake them and rethink them anew. From the kitchen to the uh, meeting room, the Biennale was just actually an excuse to create an entire new set of conversations about uniforms, about codes of conduct, about ways in which we can start designing things very differently. We even did an archaeology of the smells of the architectural office from the 1900s oak steel glue to the 1950s uh, 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 plastic glues to today. And while you might have seen some of these fabulous publications that have emerged out of this project, what for me was very important is that out of each one of those reflections, what we have is a new beginning for rethinking not only architectural practice, but also the idea of what it means to become an architect. Because becoming an architect might be making your firm, having your office, having a logo, but also having a manual about how people are going to actually work around you. And it is through this design of those structures of management and how we actually design the architecture of those spaces that I think we can have a real radical contribution. The third book of this series uh, uh, was a manual. And this manual was actually a collection of all the manuals, things that you probably never ever will study in a school of architecture, that actually tell you 
if there is a dress code, if you can take holidays, if you can teach while you work, how actually you're going to name your drawings, how you're going to talk about issues of salary, and if you can talk about salary, or if you can travel, or if you cannot, and all those moments of banality that actually regulate the architectural profession. But what was interesting for us is that what we did was to collect from all these different architectural offices from the 1900s to today, excerpts that would allow us to reflect and to compare all these architectural offices from their mission, guess what, everyone is an award-winning practice today, to um, um, uh, issues like their business model and how they actually think about uh, something that we talk very little, that is finance, to many other areas that, in fact, allowed us to really rethink about the way in which we want to position ourselves today. The book was organized on the right side with a kind of historical material, and on the left side were contributions by contemporary authors, speculating, reflecting about what is that. Of course, some of them are redacted, because guess what? The book took two years and a half to be published because they knew of a manual that is the mother of all manuals, that I was waiting for it to be leaked, and it finally was. And so what is very interesting about this book is that it actually has a lot of very interesting privileged information that you will never really get, and in fact, it's really not interesting. It's, also, it's actually tragic. It's almost comic. And I really, truly invite you to actually think and reflect about that, because it is through these kind of very simple diagrams that we don't draw while we actually are in the schools that then we produce and reproduce certain structures, certain values, and certain architectures. And so this diagram that was articulating all these 200 architecture firms that produce architecture within the US in the global context through the uh, uh, six months of the Venice Biennale through 25 different themes, that these uh, people actually try to produce an alternative to this and, and, and actually try to bring a new collective together. So as you can see, I thrive when I'm surrounded by people, probably as Hernan said, and producing any ideas through the talents and idiosyncrasies that everyone brings. And this is what is I'm actually I'm doing now at the AA. This is me, obviously, last year with the honor students uh, at the stairs at the entrance of the school. And, and it is through the students that now, obviously, I'm producing this kind of new uh, conversations. And so this was the kind of 300 students that graduated last year, but what I think is really funny about the AA is that we don't take ourselves too serious. And I think that's probably what is the most interesting part of it. Because behind these 173 years of history, um, what we have is an incredibly diverse uh, uh, set of, of, of voices. We have right now 81 nationalities, which somehow very much somehow makes me think of, of this little planet that we have in front of us. And it is through each one of the students' projects that somehow we are able to enter into this world of multiplicities and, and conversations. One of the things that has allowed me to somehow understand what is that that we do in the school, and I think probably might be applicable here too, is, is really this combination between rigor and pure madness. And, and I think that it is essential that we understand that there is no school of architecture. You cannot teach the future unless you allow for ideas that are different to emerge. But madness is not something that actually exists in isolation. In fact, it exists in relationship to a set of conditions and, and structures. And of course, what you can see in here is that this is happening with a series of languages, languages that reflect the multiplicity of those voices that are speaking them. So of course, while I'm showing here some images about where the AA and its uh, rural campus finds itself, what I really want to present today is kind of an approach to a pedagogical project that is what I'm trying to develop uh, at the school with all my colleagues and friends. And I will start with this image from 1962 uh, by Robin Evans that, of course, he talks about the uh, putrescent terminology that was surrounding architectural education at that time. And guess what? Probably hasn't left yet. Um, what is interesting about architecture and, and something that I have uh, somehow had the privilege to appreciate within American academia more than other contexts is the tendency to identify certain terms and jargons and somehow keep on moving through them and repeat them ad nauseum without necessarily knowing exactly what is that, that they are doing but giving us the comfort that they mean something for us. What I love about this image is that I try to do what many of us do, that is to do an image reverse search, and I couldn't find it, of course, because it's part of the A archives. But then I realized that there are 38.4 billion images in one of those archives, and I'm like, I don't even know what 38 billion images look like. But so, one of the new terms and words that I'm actually using, obviously, has to do with diversity. No one would be against diversity, but what does diversity mean today? And I want each one of you to imagine 
What do we mean by diversity? What is that that we care when I want difference in the, its most widest sense? What is that that we care for? Excellence. Wow, what a fantastic word. What do we mean by excellence? What do we mean by expertise? These are terms that actually at the AA we use quite a bit. And one like this one, domestic scale, is not as presumptuous as the other ones, but is an important one. Because I think it's important to think that we in fact inhabit a house, a house that for the last 173 years has relied mostly on that idea of independence. So these are four words that somehow describe what is that, that the AA stands for, the kind of values, the idea of excellence, the idea of independence, the idea of diversity, and the idea of, of domesticity. But this idea of independence is not so easy to retain. The AA, like SIARC, are independent schools. And that independence relies with alliances, sometimes with forms of capital, sometimes with forms of power. And the AA has had its difficult times. But what was for me fascinating when I arrived is that we were having a um, very interesting process, a bureaucratic process that somehow ended when I received this letter a year, a few months after I arrived at the school, telling us something that for you may mean very little. The Privy Council is the advisory council to the Queen of England that actually um, recognize that the AA now has the power to award its own degrees. This is a kind of a surreal moment, because now, since the 1st of October, the AA has the power to award its own degrees. We could call ourselves a university. We could start having masters on philosophy. We could start actually doing anything that we would imagine is relevant today. And that is beautifully dangerous. Because that actually gives us the ability to really start redefining and shaping what architecture education, but also simply what education is today. And this is, of course, how this looks in England. There is this guy who is a town crier in a blue hat, that they are real. They are really actually going to actually read messages that are given by the queen, and so we did. And here we were all ecstatic with the kind of power that the queen has bestowed on us. But of course, what is interesting is that we don't need the queen to give us any powers, mostly because the AA has been giving its diploma. Now this year, it will be a 100 year anniversary. And I think that it is that independence and that independence of thought that is essential to an institution like the AA. How does independence uh, get constantly formulated is not just by having a way of imprinting diplomas, but by actually producing a series of terms of engagement, uh, uh, ways of discussing and bringing people together around issues that we care. So this is what we started this year with Maria Giudici, who is the new head of AA Files. AA Files is one of the uh, journals uh, of record of the AA that has, over the years, allowed us to really think what architectural history criticism is and does. And to produce a first issue that I believe there were some issues uh, uh, here for you to get at the beginning of this lecture, and to rethink, again, a new set of terms of engagement. And so what we did with this first issue was to produce a lexicon from A to Z of a series of new terms of engagement, of a series of words that we believe need to be discussed today. And we invited people from within the school, outside the school, from architecture and politics and philosophy and anthropology to really discuss from A to Z what is that that we care about. So let's start with the first one, statics and a series of other ones that I'm going to take you through today as I'm trying to actually show you through a series of projects what is that that we actually mean by them. Design with beauty built in truth is the AA's motto. And yet, of course, truth today has become an interesting concept and beauty uh, another one of those. But today at the AA, the idea of beauty is actually, or aesthetics, is one that I believe is being redefined. And it is in this project of trying to find a new aesthetic project, a new aesthetic regime, that allows us all of us to come together behind an idea of what is that, that are the values that we have. Because there is no political project without an aesthetic one. And I'm going to show you a project from one of our uh, students that was sitting with me at those stairs that actually tries to produce a new aesthetic regime that reflects on that. Sean's project. 30 seconds. It was fashionable to believe that historians are liars. Julius Caesar, Winston Churchill, very good writers, but total liars. Historians, with their vested interests, have no reason to tell you the truth. <laughs> 
when the objects were released from the open prisons to the utopian cities, they were no longer manacled by their colonial past. For decades, doppelgangers of the remains found their place in the city, reappropriated, perhaps, by imagined communities in the guise of Benedict Anderson. The difference is they no longer speak on behalf of their motherland. What Sean does through this project is actually try to look into the ways in which museums have been accumulating knowledge, forms of doing, tectonics, materialities, aesthetics, and using the kind of new forms of digitization, he produces a kind of open source that allows architectures uh, to return, if you want, to their spaces of origin and to produce an entire new aesthetic regime that allows us to somehow uh, uh, go back into these ideas of tradition, breaking with the project of modernity and homogenization and globalization that we have inherited, and to really break an idea that architecture needs to happen in those spaces of uh, sublime <clears throat> A, a centrality, a, like museums or churches, and in fact you can find them in a 7-Eleven or in any kind of construction site. So the idea that aesthetics is something that it is not just developing to the more sublime of objects, but in fact on those everyday objects that has to do with history, that has to do with decolonizing knowledge, that has to do with democratizing uh, uh, processes, is one that for me is interesting. B, border. Of course, the idea that as architects we are constantly building borders, but in fact it is part of our intentions to bring them, them down, is an obvious one. And this project by Thomas, a third year student that looks into ideas of social media, satellites, and cosmic energy, is one of them in which one tries to bring together all those ideas of communication, solitude, uh, astrology, if you want, and ideas of farming together into a something that obviously might not look unfamiliar coming almost from the 70s and yet at the same time understanding how do we bring all of those different desires and conflicting ideas together. One of the things that for me has become very important is to understand once we started discussing ideas of open source, the commons, how do we as architects become active forces? What a, a, Assemble, uh, Amika and Giles here, uh, uh, who teach at DAA, uh, are talking about the idea of commoning. How do we actually actively produce architectures that produce spaces that transform ideas of ownership, that transform ideas of identity, if you want? For me, it's important. When we were talking about radical empathy, we can talk about issues of care, we can talk about issues of sense. But what I love about this project by Ryan Cook is that he takes this idea of care, obviously, into a planetary, but at the same time into a legal and policy-making space. 30 seconds. World War E. World War E is a reflection on the role of the architect today, exploring a way of redeploying the architect's skill set to respond directly to situations of urgency and crisis. Through a series of land change strategies, targeted at designated sites within the UK, the project aims to establish more extensive, efficient and diverse habitats in the loopholes of a post-EU, post-common agricultural policy Britain. Maintaining a belief in the possibility for institutions to shape and inform collective and individual action, the project introduces a new institution, the Environmental Defence Agency, as a merger between existing environmental bodies and the logistics of the UK Ministry of Defence. Ultimately, the project is an exploration of the paradigm of a new citizen politics and state to be born out of a period of climatic war. For me, what is interesting about Ryan is that as every single student at the school, what they do is actually everyone goes into a solitary journey from the second year onwards in which, independent of the brief, they end up defining their context, their site, their space of action, and their entire idea of what architecture and design is. 
Somehow, I always used to teach thesis, that is what I love to do, and to identify that, in fact, thesis is something that one finds in every single project in which one then goes into a process of like ideas of preservation or fashion or ultimately uh, construction is one that is fascinating. But the idea that now we have a, a new political body, the Environmental Defense Agency, emerging from a student speculative project is probably where I think that architecture and architecture schools can find themselves in a very interesting space of design and action. What I think is interesting about schools and schools like SIARC and the AA and very few others is how different our structures of governance are from other institutions of higher education that have come from very different traditions. And I'm saying this because while democracy sometimes might come with this image about, oh, that's the origins of democracy, democracy at the AA comes in a, in a very different form, in a very different guise. And I think it is very interesting to actually understand that one thing is to be a student in an architectural school. The other one is to be a member of an association that actually has a decision-making capital. As you probably might not know, I am standing here because I was voted in, and, and that the school, in fact, has had incredible people from Alvin Boyarsky, who was ultimately elected as the director of the a few years ago, or Kenneth Frampton, who presented himself at the same time and never got elected, uh, trying to make pedagogical propositions to lead one of the incredible institutions of architecture in the world. One of the things that I've had the privilege to do is to go into the archives and find the statements, and you would be surprised. As much as I might think I am a very radical contemporary figure that knows exactly what we should be doing today, those statements are actually almost just as valid today as they were then. We haven't changed much, and I think that that's something very interesting. So for me, what is interesting about the school is that it actually protests in many different ways and forms. The students have really managed to produce moments of agitation to the point in which the school probably would have not survived if it wasn't because of the students have taken real political action to do certain things that they believed was important. And I'm saying this because when I'm lecturing into a, uh, an auditorium that is filled with the students, you are not only here to make models and to do projects. You are here to actually envision and design a society that you would like to see flourish differently. We are here not only to actually build things and to become the cover of the next architectural magazine, but we are here to actually reimagine absolutely every single space of society. And so I think for me, the way in which I like to define architecture, that is the discipline that has the ability to reimagine or the way in which we articulate the social, the political, the economic into a collective aspiration, that goes beyond just the making of walls. And so this is the kind of discussion that the students, academic staff, and everyone else was having in the barrel vault to try to figure out if I was going to be the director. And then this was the first day in which I presented the project, and then I became one. And of course, when I became one, then you don't become the director in an office, you become the director in a table, in discussion with the students, discussing constantly, what is that that we do? Why are we doing it? What is that that we should be doing differently? Because education as a project is not something that, that is just given from the top down. It's a project that we need to constantly construct and redefine and to challenge. And that is so important because, as you can imagine, I was exactly the same as a student, meaning as annoying as I am right now. And I think that it is essential to any kind of healthy institution to have individuals who participate by questioning, who participate by challenging. And, and of course, don't get me wrong, at the AA we are not just complaining and, and, and constantly protesting. We love to party. That's probably one of the things that we are very well known for. Um, this is cocktails and conversations last year, having conversations in which each unit was translating its ideas into cocktails. Uh, and as a way of drinking them, you could actually understand the essence and ideology of their mission. But the idea of education at the AA takes in many different forms. But the one of them that surprised me, one that I had no clue before I showed up in the place, was of this incredible campus that the school has uh, all the way south uh, from London that has the size of like, this chunk of London with 250 acres of land in which students go and do things like this, in which then taking place over this series of buildings, uh, over weekends they decide to transform landscapes, to transform uh, spaces, and to ultimately transform those models to prototypes to ultimately buildings. And so this relationship between robotics and architecture, between fabrication and making, sometimes takes the form of like little Frankensteins, like this fantastic uh, photo laboratory that they did over uh, three weeks, to things that actually are a bit more 
challenging to things that actually take a tree. And if uh, Louis Kahn was asking a brick, what is that that a brick wants to be in a certain way? Here we ask, what does a tree want to be? And, and then you really start thinking of that context around uh, yourself and to start assembling it in ways that really radically transform the way in which we have thought about architecture. And it is this idea of like thinking and making and really uh, building prototypes that actually go beyond the, the 3D printer that um, architectures manifest themselves in temporary, sometimes in permanent forms, sometimes are coming out from competitions uh, that happen with the students, and then they become really some of these strange buildings that happen uh, outside in, in, in Hook Park uh, that remind us of some walking cities and that situate us at an intersection of, of new own design and at the same time action. What we did this year, we had 302 new students coming in through the undergraduate and postgraduate programs, and I decided to do one simple thing. Because many people actually would sometimes would go through five years and would not know what Hook Park was about. And so we took seven buses and we all went up there and we did one simple thing. Each one of us planted a tree, symbolically, obviously, but also literally. And so these 302 trees allowed us to, and maybe we can bring the volume a bit down because this is a, a bit loud. Um, um, it allows us to really have the feeling that I think is so important that sometimes we forget. And it is essential for us as contemporary uh, 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 dwellers of cities is to understand that the world actually goes beyond our desks or computers or screens. And that is so important to somehow abandon uh, uh, many of those kind of like points of security and, and entertainment and information that we are constantly bombarded with and to fill the void and the silence or the noise and the sound of all those things that one can encounter into a context like that one. Because what is interesting right now for me, and it's a question that I don't have an answer yet, is that this campus that has been over the last 10, 15 years, seeing buildings appear and pop up, and now that we have taught degree awarding powers, um, we have the ability to start new programs that deal with mindfulness, that deal with cooking, philosophy, biology, landscape, uh, uh, astrophysicy. You tell me. And what is interesting about a campus like this one is that, of course, we are really good in uh, really making incredible things happen. And we have the two only buildings that Frey Otto ever did in the UK. But for me, what is very interesting about this place is that it opens up that question about what is that, that that we should be teaching that no one else is teaching? And that is something that might not necessarily come from someone who has been teaching for 20 years or 60 years. That might come from someone who is still a student or someone who actually might never be a student. Um, but because, in fact, in a certain way, I would say we are all students. And so if you want to see more of those things, I invite you to go and check them online. There are plenty of it. But it is this idea that the school relates itself constantly within its London campus, the UK, and the world through a series of conversations um, that I'm trying to articulate. Idea of ethics, not morals, but ethics. How do we, as architects, that always speak on behalf of the other, do we actually gain the authority to do so? When is that that actually we consider to be enough research, enough work, to embody that society that we are supposed to represent? And I think that is a very important question when we as architects, coming from one place, operating in another, sometimes feel that we have the authority to actually speak on behalf of the other. And I'm saying this because it's, ethics is a real space of action, but one that can be dangerously used and abused. This year, we have started a new project at the AA. It's the AA Residence, in which what we are actually doing is allowing for spaces of research and development by academic staff, but also students, to come around as different agendas and to produce an incubator space for people who just graduate to start their careers because I'm interested in producing a safe space for dangerous ideas. And we just launched two of them. One of them is the Ground Lab that actually is with, it's funded with the Inter-American Development Bank and directed by Clara and Alfredo that looks into issues of climate change, deforestation in the uh, global south, and obviously into issues of uh, pattern migration, population growth, and trying to actually visualize things that are happening but do not necessarily have yet the ability to give us forms of action or forms of transformation. The idea that, in fact, as architects, what we give is form to ideas and phenomena that is already there and that we, in fact, what we do sometimes is to shape it 
and to transform it is an obvious thing to say. But what I think is very important for us as part of this ground lab is to understand how can we really make sure that that information is also accessible to everyone who owns that data and how people can have access to it. How can we become real activists by producing images that put in evidence some of the phenomena that is surrounding us? Of course, each one of these labs, they are interrelated with some of the postgraduate programs. This one has to do with the one on landscape and urbanism. But what is interesting is that, for instance, the Wood Lab that is funded by John McPeace, one of the founders originally of Hook Park, is going to be looking into the history of the place, but also look into the idea of timber and how timber obviously can operate, not only as a kind of global transaction of resource, but the idea of local timber uh, uh, used in different places around the world and specifically in the UK. And of course, what I'm interested in is in actually producing as many labs as people People because the idea is how do you allow and give a space for people to develop their own ideas. Of course, this idea of flexibility, um, I always love Oliver, who is the architectural critic in The Guardian, uh, when he uh, likes to actually put the knife and poke into very important cliches that we have developed over the last few years, like the one of flexibility, and really try to actually somehow allow us to liberate ourselves from some of those and, and give us a space to produce somehow other uh, uh, concepts and ideas that might be able to somehow generate um, new cliches, if you want, but also probably more relevant ones. What I love about these images of the DRL is that, of course, it takes the idea of flexibility into an entire new uh, dimension. What I love when uh, some guests or friends or students come to the school is that I take them all the way up into uh, uh, Theo and, and his team to somehow see some of these little robots and machines that they manage to produce and, and somehow allow them to play uh, uh, nicely with, um, with some of the new technologies that other disciplines are developing, but that us as architects have the real privilege to somehow test, question, and push, and to really start thinking about what is that that we can do. Because it's not only about assembling those forces that I mentioned before, it's also bringing bring all these different intelligences and to produce an entire new set of conglomerates of people who actually are able to, to produce certain forms of intelligence, but not necessarily always to transform them into something that have a consequence and implication into the into the built world. And so, of course, one could be probably spending two hours watching each one of those animations and each one of those transformations, but um, I will spare you that pleasure for your intimate hours in front of uh, uh, internet. What is for me fantastic uh, uh, um, about looking into the school is, is some of these very dangerous words that we have been using and we feel very, very you know, tense when we talk about global. What is that that we mean about global? And what is that that actually is the value of this consciousness that uh, we have gained by not only images, but by also concerns? Is that, that we need to understand what is the global uh, context in which we operate, but also the local desires that we are able to generate. I inherited an institution uh, with uh, hundreds uh, and 70 some years of history, but with the last 10 years, the AA produced something that many of you might know, that is it's, it's visiting a school. And so 10 years ago, the school started to have small workshops happening in different places of the world, and it was like nine years ago, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, and you're like, whoa, there is this incredible world that the school has been engaging, working with local experts, and sometimes making workshops that some of them were fantastic, some of them were maybe less fantastic, but it has managed to produce a global map of global desires and local understandings. And so when I look into these and each one of them, and I try to understand how each different context allows us to think about the world differently, what I ask, uh, um, the Ground Lab actually to produce was like, could you put me all these visiting schools together so I could visualize what is that that we have done over the last 10 years, from 2011 to today, and to really organize it through different themes so that we can start looking into how many different, if you want, schools we have had running with connective threads. So when you look there and you say technology or computational uh, elements or materiality, what you start seeing is a kind of a global school that is happening simultaneously in different places of the world or one after the other that allows us to think about contemporary issues from a global point of view, but from a local understanding. And so what does a producer like me do? It's just connect dots, right? I would say probably one of my only qualities is that 
I like to connect people and ideas together. And so what we are doing now with the uh, visiting school, we are starting, as you see, connecting each one of those programs and to really somehow produce a, a world of expertise and knowledge that might allow us to take this world and then think that each one of them has a kind of a pedagogical little agenda and then say, well, you know, we could start in London and then you can go to New York and then you go to Vancouver or Los Angeles, Buenos Aires, Antarctica. And over a year, you actually go through a journey through each one of those visiting schools and you end up back in London. And after a year, what you actually have gone is to explore uh, with local experts a very set of issues that allows you to actually get a global nomadic master. So we are in the works with that. And I hope that this pandemic is gone because then we are all going to be traveling. If not, we are going to be all very quiet. But what is very interesting about this is that education needs to change. And we know that education might not necessarily happen inside the walls of a school. And I think it's so important that we, as a schools, we start adopting some of these formats. And I think the idea of collaboration and partnership, the reason why I took a plane and I came here today, is because I think it's so important that we all share and actually inform and learn and in a certain way contaminate each other with all of that. And so, of course, as the first uh, of our uh, 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 student project showed us, there is not one history, there are many histories, and there is a role in actually all of us rewriting those. What is fantastic about the school is that, of course, it has seen a lot of histories through its walls. This is an image in which you can see in the wall in the top right, ladies and gents, and of course, you, you might not be able to read it, but in the center it says the paint has been sponsored by a lead paint company. Uh, of course, not allowed anymore. There are some toxic stuff uh, sometimes up in the walls that you only learn a few years after. And what is interesting about this idea of history is that many of you may uh, know this image. This is one of my predecessors, um, Alvin Boyarski, on an elephant. Um, in front of the school. We are a totally crazy cool school, but while this image was really fun for many years, I don't think that anyone would find it fun that Hernan would show up in an elephant or that I would show up in an elephant. We have a very different perception of what uh, uh, that relationship with animals is today. Why am I saying this? It's because history is changing. The perception of who we are is changing. And there are a lot of things that are not all right anymore. And we are seeing that all over the place, and it's so important. And that is not just happening with issues of gender, toxicity, or elephants. That happens also with the history of architecture. And so this last year, we started with these new canonical histories, inviting relevant figures within culture to really come in front of us with architectural expertise and many other forms of understanding to really help us produce an entire new set of voices to actually produce new architectural histories. One of the things that I started doing when I arrived in the school was to say, you know, I, I don't know enough about what is happening. I know there are years, I know there are programs, but what I'm interested in is in all of us having conversations. So we started having open seminars in which um, anyone is invited, any person in London, you can show up in London, you can actually go to the seminar. And we had three of them. This year we had Plan the Planet that actually was dealing with issues of climate and, and sustainability. Uh, with John Palmesino and Anne Sophie that have been working on the uh, Anthropocene and, and many of those issues for quite a long time. We had on Tuesdays evidentiary aesthetics with Ayal Wiseman and Christina Bavia in issues of forensic architecture and the way in which the aesthetic project really can help us uh, uh, produce legal cases beyond architectural ones. And Pierre Vittorio and Maria Giudici with the origins of capitalist urban space. Why is for me so important to have these open seminars by which intellectual figures within the school have the ability to have students from first year to the PhD all together in a room with different voices from the city coming into the school to share? It's because that's what a school of thought should be about. Education is not about tuition fee. Education is not actually about registration. Education is about having conversations with people who want to have a conversation. And so with this, we have art and architecture, and we are going to have this year the off the record, where there will be no cameras, where there will be no microphones, where there will be no phones, and there will be just people talking about things that are difficult to talk about. Because it is true that, you know, Usually I always say what I think, that's one of my virtues or defects. But imagine if there was no cameras and no microphones. There are a lot of other histories to be told that we need to share, from finance models to emotional ones. And so 
Many of the things that we have done this year is to understand how is that what the school has been doing constitutes ideas of positions and, um, and try to actually open up. One of the things that I hope that SIRE can start doing and anyone should be doing is the idea of open tutorials. Um, maybe you already have it, but it's the idea that I, every Monday what I do, I sit down with a, a series of colleagues in the front members room and we just have tutorials with all students throughout the school. Because the idea that each one of you can have a conversation with any other professor, not going to their office hours, but in fact having a collective space to share ideas, I think it's a healthy thing. I think it's very important that we actually are able to break the walls from the boundaries of the student-professor relationship and to actually make and realize that it is in each one of us the, the responsibility of making that happen. And of course, these open tutorials or open juries take all kind of different forms. And it is always the student, and this is the student publications or some of the student initiatives that are the ones that, that make me think the most. The idea of practice is one that has been at the forefront of, uh, of our students' concerns. How does one rethink the idea of clients? Who are the clients that we want? Are those people who are just existing out there, who are those wealth individuals, or are the new forms of alliance that we can create only with them, but also among ourselves as architects, or the idea of risk? How can we afford this, and what does risk actually mean today? And so it is with this tradition of making publications and, and, and really trying to ask difficult questions that I was looking through the archive and I found this publication that I started in the 1948, as you can see. And in this editorial text that you can find on the right side, if you would be reading very fast that text, you would actually be shocked how this text from the 1950s is so present and so contemporary talking about sustainability, talking about climate change, talking about the urgency. And the idea here is that most of the important questions in architecture have been around for thousands of years. And yet there are some of those moments in which the 70s uh, were uh, really good in articulating, and I think we need to keep on doing so. The A publications is something that two years ago had to go through a pause, but it, they constitute an essential part of our home, and we are retaking them back. And so it is interesting when I like to talk about the AA and its buildings that, in fact, no one would recognize them like this because, in fact, these are not the plans. These are mental plans of how everyone constitutes a place for action and, and production. This is Joan Mariner. She is one of the Amnesty International representatives. She wrote an article in A Files in which she obviously talks about ideas of justice. And for me, it's very interesting. Can we, as architects, engage with the ideas of justice? And what does that mean? So this is a project by Lola Conte, in which she actually started looking into all the courtrooms in the UK and really think about ways in which we can, as architects, redesign something very simple, that is the interface between the digital screens that constitute the ways in which one can ask for asylum today um, or be judged. Um, and the physical space of interrogation. What is interesting about Lola's project is that it took something that has to do with digital and physical interaction, and she really tried to produce a new space for justice, for immigrants, and people engaged within the legal system. And so, somehow, many of these terms that I'm not going to talk about them all have to do with ways in which architecture is being defined and redefined today. And why I find it interesting to talk about them, not necessarily from my own reflection, but by a student's reflection, is because I think it gives us a way to understand how we want to practice. Sam Little started looking into these, <clears throat> farmers' magazines. And he found one thing, that is within the UK, there are plenty of steel beams that actually cannot be really reused because they have profiles that are not necessarily coming together in an easy way. So, of course, he started looking to the steel beam production and, and reuse and recycling, and he started producing new capitals. If you want, almost as a kind of new Doric, Jonic, and Corinthian order, but of like steel uh, 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 reconstruction, to produce an entire new style of warehouses for agricultural uh, voices. What was interesting about Sam, I said, I'm only going to take you serious if you publish something in the Farmer's Guardian. And, of course, guess what? He did. And, and so the fact that we might imagine or fantasize that our architectures need to be published in some of those magazines that we all fantasize about, it's not anymore. It is about finding the medium and the voices and the audiences that will make your architecture and your projects real. 
The project that actually was happening within uh, the unit of Rotor is one that, that really actually was one of the finalists for the Bezalea Awards this year. But this is what for me is interesting is to actually see that the student projects within a unit, they just take their own dimension. And so it is through this idea of really taking very seriously the idea of politics, context, ecology, that some of the programs at DAA are really sometimes about very simple things. This case is a, this is a project from the Landscape and Urbanism Postgraduate Master that really looks into the way in which the British government really understands the idea of forest. A forest is not just a natural phenomenon. A forest is actually a legal, protected, built, constructed, and regulated space. What a productive forest is and is not, is actually something that has a particular idea of a grid, and a grid that actually has specific conditions within them. What I love about this is that while we, in a few years ago, might have been talking about the grid as something that actually relates to particular figures in architecture, well, I think it's time for us to move on from those grids to other grids. And what is really interesting about this project is that it really looks into how community engagement can participate in the transformation of lazy landscapes or non-productive landscapes to really important landscapes. And so the idea of, of for who are we working and, and what is that that actually we are building is something that, that I'm very interested in. The idea of ownership and who owns what is, is an interesting one. This project by Eva Ivanez looks into something that I didn't know even existed, that has to do with the idea of, you know, it's in Scotland you have these peatlands that actually emit CO2 if you don't cultivate them. But if you keep on working on them, if you keep on irrigating them, if you keep on giving them some care and love, they don't emit CO2. Because they are protected landscapes, they actually have the right to emit that CO2. So Eva, she thought, well, maybe what I could do is to produce a carbon credit. And I could actually make people invest in this landscape and allow for us to actually uh, produce a CO2 non-emission uh, credit exchange. And what is interesting about this project is that what it does, it just really tries to produce a new economic system with an entire labor structure, with an entire new landscape structure that then has a kind of aesthetic uh, uh, perception into it. A project that actually tries to produce an entire economical, territorial, and aesthetic uh, uh, aspiration came with a, this kind of volume of research and action. But so this is where I'm interested in, in identifying some of those important conversations. Sergei Kuznetsov, Kuznetsov he was the uh, architect of the city of Moscow for a few years. He knows very well that actually every single politician is always trying to build their own architecture in some way or form. We are now, obviously, still digesting uh, 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 what the president of this country said a few weeks ago in trying to make uh, uh, architecture great again. And, and we constantly are dealing with issues that, well, architecture carries with itself ideologies and power, and architecture has the ability to produce certain ideologies. Then we have moments in which we are like, no, as architects, we should not be able to design certain buildings because it's ethically wrong, or actually we should be designing those buildings because we can ethically liberate those spaces. Or then you have, I mean, this is one of your alumni. I found his uh, uh, meme pretty like funny. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, it's like, whoa, like, yeah, we are in trouble. Um, um, and, and, and you know, like, this for me is a very interesting image because I, I, I googled motel, motel and prostitution, right? We all know that in, like most of motels in many places actually are used for very dubious practices, what we could call forms of contemporary slavery. But no one actually would question if you were commissioned to design a motel, you would say, what is gonna happen in there? No, but if you do a prison, you actually might get someone asking you, are you going to design that prison? Or if someone is asking you to design an office building, when you know that in those offices there are going to be like very problematic practices taking place in there. We as architects are in a very different, difficult space to actually understand how do we practice, where do we practice, and how do we stand behind our practice. The world practice in the A files issue appears 149 times. It's probably one of the things that actually is concerning 
our students, our academic staff the most. And what we do most of the times, we practice things that actually had to do with reviews and conversations and discussions. But what I'm very interested in is the idea of how do we practice the idea of resistance and questioning and really actually having this history of resistance and debating and actually burning things and taking things and taking reality into an entire new dimension, making fireworks or actually going to the archive. The AA has been a place in which this has taken different forms that sometimes are more benign than others. And actually, I'm very interested in somehow figuring out what that means today. We don't have the luxury of a space as much as you do, nor maybe of technology. But what is interesting about the school is that it allows us to somehow produce a series of moments of reflection and engagement with issues that we believe are important. I don't know how many of you are interested in issues of, of sustainability, but if you're interested in what actually um, architecture students are doing in the UK, I suggest that you go into this architecture education declares and look into some of the questions that are being asked today and to reflect on the ideas that, that each one of us can bring into this idea of pedagogy and education. One of the last projects I want to show you has to do with, with this, with the idea of translation. And with the idea, in fact, that, that we do speak 40 languages in the school and that the AA is not just this two A's, one next to each other, but in fact the AA is also this, and is also this, and is also this, and is also this, and is also this. That the AA is this space of inflection and difference, that the AA is in fact a space of multiplicities, that is a space that is constantly shifting, and it is in this space of translation in which then we find our differences and we can start finding a new space of innovation. Trying to somehow redefine the way in which we think about architecture and space, many of you might know, and, and for sure Hernan knows, that this is uh, a Thawan. Few of you might know that this was Georgia Okifi's Thawan. Um, and that Thawan as a space and as a typology and as a function is one that has very specific connotations. And it is not just the whole and it is not just the entrance, but it is not one that actually we might necessarily know today. How do we expand our vocabulary and our spaces? Something that we are doing in the school by something that I also invite all of you to do, that is to do juries in translation. The first one that we did was in Mandarin. The second one just happened two weeks ago was in Arabic. And what we do is we really bring people around the table who speak the language uh, that is their native language or that actually are speaking the language of projects that are happening. And this project does two things. It allows us to build towards this multilingual dictionary of architectural terms in which we are going to try to translate from Mandarin to English to Catalan to whatever languages we are going to be uh, working with to identify terms that have not only semiotic but also spatial and cultural legacies that we might be losing because, let's not forget it, English is not my language. I might think that I can speak it, but I promise you I have probably at least 15,000 words more in Catalan that is my mother tongue language. And why is that important is because there is a kind of homogenic and hegemonic form of expressing and discussing that English is actually giving us, despite the fact that I know and I feel that I'm actually free no matter what language you give me, I'm also limited by the ability of you really operate with certain tools. So why is this interesting is because I think we are missing in some of the cultures, and I hope that we regain them. And so the virtual is something that, obviously, I don't need to explain it. This is a house that has been looking into the ways in which we identify new technologies and the way in which we are going to be designing in the future. It's not going to be limited by those tools or those languages that we have inherited. We are creating constantly new languages, and we are creating new tools to actually identify and to render the world around ourselves anew. But probably one of the most important questions that we have is, is to really understand how in the near future this relationship between the physical, the virtual, the augmented uh, is going to transform also the way in which we deal with history and the present, but ultimately the future. I'm sure that at some point I will be a hologram and I want to make sure that we as architects are able to capture what is that that, that matters. That is not just an image that might have to do with my voice, that might have to do with all the biomes that I carry, that might have to do with many more things that we might have imagined. And one of the important things that um, I'm always interested in reflecting about is about how many ways we have to actually represent and to draw and to think about the place that surrounds us, from the smells to the biomes. And I think these days when we are more conscious than ever about things that we can see, that architecture, in fact, is also dealing with that. 
Youth is something that I always will feel I have, although I do know that it is definitely something that keeps on changing. We live in a generation in which social media has become a prevalent mode of communication, and yet I do hope that sometimes we forget about those forms of easy gratification and fast consumption and start producing things that actually produce a new aesthetic. I started with it and I'm going to finish with it. Because aesthetics, as I said before, at the AA now deal with issues of politics, ethics, finances, empathy, and care. And it is through the school, if you walk through the corridors and if you go to the finance office, that you will find aesthetics in its door. And it is in the walls of that office that you will find one of our first year students' projects that then obviously takes us into an entire new universe and dimension that is ultimately this world that we are constantly building in. Um, what I really wanted to do is somehow to share with you the kind of vision that I have for the future of not only the AA, but of architecture. That is this idea of expanding horizons. And expanding the horizons of the possible is something that I know that we can all do, that we all have been doing um, as people who are committed to the, not only the transmission of architectural knowledge, but the generation of new one. When I uh, moved to the AA, I, I found this institution to be literally a home. Um, mostly because, as Hernan said, um, similarly to what uh, Storefront for Art and Architecture did for me, it gave me the ability to work with incredible people that I can see today sitting in this, in this lecture hall in many different capacities, and, and to really learn with them, through them, and to somehow help us change the way in which we think about the world around us and the histories in front of us. It is through moments like this one that is walking into the library or then walking into a room uh, or sitting at the bar that, that I'm trying to actually direct an institution that somehow doesn't need a director. And I think the best institutions are the ones that somehow carry within their walls their mission and vision to really some push that what is that that we are supposed to be doing. I think uh, similarly to this one, the AA is a place where we take the word experimentation seriously. And experimentation is not just something about how things look, it's actually how things act. It's not only about uh, something that it is inherent in, uh, in an image or inherent in a statement or inherent in a thought, something that actually needs to be tested, discussed, debated, and problematized. And it is through this act and exercise of taking a plane, being here with you, that I want to somehow thank everyone for uh, being part of this conversation that uh, is one that I'm trying to constantly articulate and re-articulate, that is how can we become today an architect, and especially an architect. Thank you, everyone.